As fallout from the Silicon Valley bank collapse continues, some moderate Senate Democrats are resisting new rules that would impose tougher regulations on banks. Democratic Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado joins me now. He is a member of the Senate Finance Committee and one of those senators who stands by their 2018 vote to ease scrutiny on certain banks. Senator, let's start with that because there's a lot of people pointing fingers right now saying this would not have happened if those rules had not have been rolled back. Well, first of all, and Guy Adami said it in our last segment, even if the full force of the original Dodd-Frank was in place, Silicon Valley Bank would have passed. So help us understand, take us back to 2018. Why did you vote yeah. to ease those rules and why do you stand by it today? Yeah, let me say, Guy, Stephanie, it's great to see you again. Guy said it. The Treasury Secretary today said it. And the vote in 2018 for me was actually fairly straightforward. I've been working for 10 years with Colorado's local banks, with rural banks throughout the Rocky Mountain West, who, you know, as a result of the downturn and the regulation that it, we have put in place uh, after the big downturn in, in 09 and 08, you know, we'd seen massive consolidation in the banking industry, and we'd seen these small banks getting, you know, having to comply with regulations that were very appropriate for the largest banks in America to have to deal with. But these small banks were really struggling to be able to pay the overhead to, to, to meet those regulations. And that was what the bill in 2018 was an attempt to do, at least for my part. And obviously, there were provisions in there for the Fed to exercise its discretion on banks the size of Silicon Valley Bank, which, by the way, is eight times or more <laughs> the size of the banks that we're talking about in Colorado and in rural America, which have only gotten more consolidated and more gobbled up as the years have gone by. And now I think the people that know the situation best can see it for what it is, which is a huge number of mistakes that they made, the bank made here. I mean, ridiculous mistakes that you never would have made. You know, they quadrupled their their asset assets over like four years. So they should have known if it's going to go up that fast, it could collapse. They were incredibly heavily weighted toward tech, which they, I mean, looked great during COVID, but when it came out, as you know, that sector moves together all the time, and they had, were very concentrated there. And then for reasons that I could certainly not, you know, I don't understand, they started to buy, you know, they went long paper that had really low interest rates when Jay Powell was telling everybody on planet Earth that he was going to raise rates for the reason that Guy said. So where was the audit committee? Where was the board of the bank? Where was the regulator? Forget, even forget Dodd-Frank. You know, like what was the basic blocking and tackling that Americans should be able to expect out of their banks, whether they're tiny banks or huge banks, and out of the regulator? And I but think- But here's the problem, Senator. All the questions you're asking are such important ones, right? Where was the audit committee? Where, you know, where was the CEO of this? How, how did this happen? So a full autopsy is going to happen. All the questions will be asked. But at the end of the day, if nothing they did was illegal, if it was just outrageously stupid, then there'll be no real consequences. And are you worried we're going to face backlash from the American people like we did after the financial crisis? Well, I've, you know, actually, that's such an interesting question, Stephanie. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I was in the private sector when we had the the telecom boom in in this country. And you'll remember you were working in the private sector too, probably then as well. And I can remember those those those, those anchors, not you, those anchors on some other networks pumping up these stocks day after day after day. That's when my mom first bought Amazon com stock, as she called it back then. And you know, sometimes things that are stupid aren't illegal. Uh, and often, like 80% of the stuff that gets us into trouble is actually stupid, not illegal. But that's not a reason we shouldn't look, and we should make sure that we make the best decisions we can based on the facts as we understand them, not a bunch of sound bites on, with all respect, to all other programs, cable television. New topic, a very, very serious one. We have been covering on this network the medication abortion case in Texas. Talk to us about how your state, Colorado, would be affected if abortion pills are banned. 
This is part of a national ban that the Republican Party is trying to put on this country. My state was the first state to legalize abortion in America five years before Roe versus Wade was even decided. We were the first state to uh, codify a woman's right to choose after the Dobbs decision stripped women of a, and, and Americans of a constitutional fundamental freedom for the first time in American history since Reconstruction. And now we're seeing the aftermath. And if if this judge, who, by the way, today, Stephanie, was literally asking about 19th century morality laws, about carrying immoral products from one state to another, as if that is the case with a chemical that was approved by the FDA 20 years ago and has been used by 5 million American women, you know how much trouble we're in. And we've got to fight to make sure that we codify Roe versus Wade uh, as the law of the land. That's what the people of Colorado want. I think that's- 19th century morality laws. We have no more time, but I have to ask you this one question. Mitch McConnell, in the past, you have been very clear about what a, what a impossible person he is, that you have viewed him as public enemy number one in the Republican Party. Has that view changed? Because in the last six months, it appears that Mitch McConnell is more willing to work with Democrats. Well, 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 Kevin McCarthy's vote was being held up and he was being held hostage by the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates. It was Mitch McConnell at a bridge in, I think, Ohio with Mike DeWine and Joe Biden. I think it might have been in Kentucky, actually. Kentucky, where, you're right. You know, Kentucky. He, 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 Mitch McConnell, had been fighting for that. That's his home state or home commonwealth. And, Stephanie, I'm not going to say one <laughs> negative word for once about Mitch because I know he's <laughs> convalescing because he fell and he hurt himself. So I hope, I hope, I just wish him all the best. But I will say this. When Joe Biden became president and I was just running for re-election last November, I was able to tick off bipartisan infrastructure law, bipartisan veterans law, bipartisan postal reform law, bipartisan law, finally, the first time since Reagan was president and shipped everything overseas to Southeast Asia. We had a law that said, you know what, we're going to bring it back to the United States. So McConnell had a role to play in all that. And uh, and I'm grateful that he did because the American people saw that and they liked it. And they said, we don't have to go back to the freaking chaos of Donald Trump. We can expect something better than that from our exercise in self-government. So the one bill the Republicans wouldn't vote for that was important at the end was a bill that capped drug prices for seniors at $2,000, required Medicare to negotiate on behalf of the American people, and capped insulin at 35 bucks. They wouldn't even, and they stripped the provisions of that bill that would have capped insulin for all Americans at $35. And that's why we have to keep fighting but I'm very glad that we were able to get the bipartisan stuff some stuff done that we did get done. Senator Bennett bringing the heat tonight.